I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to Beyond Ocean, a session which is part of the virtual ocean dialogues hosted by the Friends of Ocean Action and the World Economic Forum. It is the first ever completely virtual global ocean event. My name is Sarah Kelly. I'm a TV news anchor and a journalist. I host the main international news program at Deutsche Welle Television in Berlin and the political talk show Conflict Zone. And I am really thrilled to be with you over the next hour in order to be your moderator. Well, as you might have guessed from the title, today's session is all about going beyond the ocean. So what does that mean? Well, action to protect the ocean presents quite literally an ocean of solutions that can benefit our societies by addressing other critical issues, including food security, nutrition, global trade and transport, poverty, human rights, gender equality, education, climate action, and that's really just to name a few. So taking ocean action goes way beyond ocean specific issues. In today's session, we will ask how we can make those connections between the ocean and the rest of society more explicit and drive the sustainable development agenda forward in a way that benefits people and nature alike. The outcomes of this session will be presented to the hosts and the organizers of the UN Ocean Conference to be held in due course in Lisbon, Portugal. So as you can see, there is really a lot to cover today. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick notes for you. Uh, these dialogues are bringing together leaders from business, government, civil society, the scientific community from around the world in order to share and scale innovations and solutions and accelerate their benefits worldwide. Therefore, the goal is to have a very live, interactive, action-oriented conversation. So participation is very much strongly encouraged. We are using the interface Slido. Many of you may be familiar with it. There you can submit your questions and you can also answer our poll. You go to slido.com. You can see our poll already there. And when you go to slido.com, enter Ocean Dialogues, then go to our session, Beyond Ocean. There you submit your questions and you can answer this poll, um, which is which other SDGs do you think ocean protection will help achieve? And you can see that we have um, all of the SDGs listed there. We do not have the numbers. So please do use the words when you enter in your answer because we're going to be creating a word cloud that will be integrated into our conversation. So now let's get started. Um, without any further ado, to welcome us here, we have the great honor and the great pleasure of hearing from the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. In a mana, in a reo, in a iwi, in a rau rangatira ma, tina koutou katoa, and greetings from the Blue Pacific. Thank you to the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action for this invitation to speak to you today. Let me first acknowledge the difficult times we are currently living in and the enormous challenge we are facing as countries and as communities. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an unparalleled shock to our system and our lives. Deep impacts to health, society and the economy have been felt acutely by every country in the world and we will continue to see ramifications for some time to come. In New Zealand, we say, he waka e noa. we are all in this together. It's an expression with meaning beyond New Zealand in times like these. But as we start building our way out of the COVID-19 crisis, there is an opportunity to build back better, to address enduring issues like climate change and challenges facing the environment. For countries in our Blue Pacific region, ocean health is important for a long-term sustainable recovery where people and planet thrive. 98% of the Pacific region is ocean. Economies and jobs rely heavily on the ocean, for example, through fisheries, aquaculture, tourism and shipping. Livelihoods and cultures are closely linked to ocean, ocean conservation and the use of marine resources. Coastal ecosystems provide protection from natural disasters. Connections like these are reminders that a healthy, productive ocean provides benefits across all dimensions of sustainable development. Indeed, as a region, we advocated for a specific ocean sustainable development goal, precisely because the phrase, 
ocean health equals human health and wealth is one that's especially meaningful in the Pacific. As we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, these connections are added incentive to drive ocean action forward and to work together to tackle challenges facing the ocean, like those associated with the climate change nexus. In their own words, climate change remains the greatest single threat to the people of the Pacific, as coasts erode, sea levels rise and fish stocks move. It's not a hypothetical, but a reality in places I've seen with my own eyes, like Tuvalu, Tokelau and Samoa. This is not a time to slow down our efforts. New Zealand is committed to this. Amongst other action, we've committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and will continue to be a leading advocate for the reduction and ultimately elimination of fossil fuel subsidies internationally. Working with Costa Rica, Fiji, Iceland, Norway and Switzerland, we are laying foundations for a groundbreaking agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability, which will bring together some of the interrelated elements of these agendas and demonstrate how they can be mutually reinforcing. Continuing to invest in multilateral ocean cooperation also bolsters our chance of securing the long-term sustainable recovery that's needed. For New Zealand, this means staying the course and concluding negotiations for a new UN treaty to improve the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity on high seas. It means a rapid conclusion to WTO negotiations aimed at prohibiting harmful fishing subsidies, which will have significant environmental, developmental and economic benefits for all. It means driving deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and reduce the burden of carbon dioxide absorption borne by the ocean. It means we keep pushing for the achievement of SDG 14 commitments through high level events such as the next UN Ocean Conference co-hosted by Portugal and Kenya and the next Our Ocean Conference hosted by the Republic of Palau in the Pacific and through initiatives like the Commonwealth Blue Charter. It means that we continue to support the global battle against plastic pollution and the protection of marine biodiversity through a representative network of marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. It means we are working with Pacific Island countries and seeking to ensure that countries do not lose rights over their marine resources and maritime zones as a result of sea level rise and climate change. Progress on this suite of issues can drive the sustainable development agenda forward in a way which benefits people and the planet alike. We will emerge from this crisis, but we must emerge a stronger, more sustainable global community that looks out for each other and for future generations. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So ocean health equals human health and wealth. That was the Prime Minister of New Zealand welcoming us here today. Let's begin our conversation on Beyond Ocean. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. We have Michelle Bachelet, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the former president of Chile. Kitlan Kabua is a member of parliament and minister of education, sports and training of the Marshall Islands. Dr. Bridget Seegers is an oceanographer at NASA, and Steve Cotton is Secretary General of the International Transport Workers Federation. Thank you so much to all of you um, for being with us here today. And hi, Commissioner Bachelet, I'd like to begin with you. Um, as you are a longtime champion of human rights, um, in fact, uh, a champion of the ocean, um, set the stage for us, because this session is beyond ocean. How important and urgent is it for us to think about ocean action as being about so much more than just the ocean itself and identifying those connections? Can you listen to me? We okay. hear you now. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, the, as we all know, the SDG 14 Life Below, Below Water calls for protection of ocean system marine resources for sustainable development. 
And, and we know we're going beyond ocean, and I will do that linkage because it's key, because healthy ocean systems support sustainable development and decent work. We can eradicate poverty. We can capture carbon dioxide. We can protect life on land from extreme weather events and uh, storm surges and stability of climate systems. But on the other hand, hundreds of millions of people depend on the ocean for their livelihoods, as we heard the Prime Minister of New Zealand mentioning in terms of uh, fishing, tourism, marine tourism, uh, shipping, uh, energy. But also we know that the fisheries and agriculture sector alone supports the livelihood of 10 to 12 percent of uh, uh, the whole world's population, providing critical nutrition. And, and for more than 1 billion people where uh, seafood is the main source of protein. And of course, also, uh, it's a big um, source of employment for more than 200 million people that work directly in this, plus others that work indirectly. So um, even though the ocean is a foundation for vibrant economy, uh, good, goods and services from the oceans uh, generate 2.5 trillion US dollars a year, and is expected to double by 2030. So it makes the ocean the seventh largest economy in the world today. But in addition, by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, oceans also provide a buffer against climate change and its negative human rights um, um, impact, if I may say. And also we know that healthy coral reefs and um, mangrove uh, ecosystem are the first line of defense against rising sea levels, storm surges, and stream weather events. So it's clearly that um, there is a linkage, direct linkage on uh, ocean, uh, healthy oceans, uh, with uh, another, a lot of other areas that impacts human rights and that impacts uh, other sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030 that would permit to leave no one behind. Thank you so much for, for setting up the importance of what we are discussing here today. And Minister Kabu, I'd like to turn to you next, um, perhaps also to underscore that urgency that we just heard from the High Commissioner, because you're joining us from an island nation. Uh, we have to mention um, thank you for joining us because it is in, in the middle of the night where you are in the Pacific. Um, you have certainly been impacted by the health of our oceans. You're facing a lot of challenges, but you're also finding a lot of solutions, you know, also to tap into that economic potential um, that the High Commissioner was talking about, the fact that this is now, this is the seventh largest economy in the world. So if you could just speak with us about um, your country, your work there, and the importance of these links between the health of the ocean and the well-being of your citizens. Thank you so much, Sarah, and e greetings to everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, Prime Minister Jacinda and and the High Commissioner for their statements. And it's true, from the islands, you know, ocean is our lifeline. You know, it's the bringer of wealth and life, and for us, it's it's the bringer of doom. And the argument that I've been hearing throughout this week during this virtual uh, dialogue is trying to find the connection between the ocean and its relevance to us human beings. What we fail to understand and make clear is that us human beings, we're just a, a, a minute part of this massive ecosystem. We need to re rediscover and find our place in this, this broader scheme of things, a broader scope of things. And I want to thank um, my ancestors and, and the government for highlighting the importance of culture. You know, culture is, is something that educates us and, and reminds us of our unique position in life. And as I mentioned earlier, the ocean is something that we grew up with as, as our supermarket, as our pharmacy, as our highway you know, to, to bridge us to the rest of the world. And I mentioned uh, the importance of culture in, in preserving and highlighting the importance of the ocean. This is something that um, we're, we're introducing in the education sector and, and I myself being the Minister of Education see the importance of this, of this linkage. Trying to urge our students our children, our future leaders, to look back in order to move forward. To look back at what was important to our ancestors, which is the ocean. And, and you know, they, they found the, the importance and, and criticalness of the ocean to sustaining life. 
just to remind our students and our, our, our youth of that um, importance. And um, unfortunately for 60 years after colonization, um, we've been stuck in this education system that's been pulling us away from our cultural heritage, from our knowledge. Um, and now on, I, I, I commend the government of the Marshall Islands for recognizing the importance of tapping back, of looking back and really discovering ourselves as, as Pacific Islanders, as you know, descendants of ancestors who saw the ocean not as something daunting, but as a bringer of life. So this is something that that um, it's a it's a crusade that we'll be fighting for uh, here in the Marshall Islands, as well as uh, the rest of the Pacific nations. Thank you so much. Thank you for underscoring uh, that importance. And Steve, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, something that I found quite interesting is the fact that you were you were asked to describe what Beyond Ocean meant to you, and you gave the following words: accountability and responsibility, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us what that means, especially in the context of your work, because you're fighting for decent and fair work conditions for seafarers and fishers. Again, that's, that's um, something that we also heard the High Commissioner mention as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so first, I'd like to say thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have so many things I want to say, and I'm trying to condense it down and make some sense. So for the first question is, um, we, rep we represent 20 million transport workers, but 2 million workers, seafarers, they work on the sea, and that's their place of work. And then, of course, I'll come to fisheries in a moment. But I think all of us as a society and particularly when we look at the objectives of the sustainable goals is to improve our lives and the lives of everybody on the planet so there's a recognition um, similar to the previous speakers and particularly our colleague from the marshall islands the ocean provides a living and, a, and an opportunity for people so there are two million seafarers at the moment and unfortunately because of the pandemic we have some serious challenges about those seafarers getting on and off board vessels and we're working with all of the UN agencies and a big thank you to all of them to try to solve that problem but for us the big point is whether you're a fisher whether you're an acro fisher worker creating food places and whether you're delivering uh, goods on ships or without throughout the whole supply chain we think it's critical that we have responsibility when it comes to the planet, but also to the workers that sustain their living and provide um, foodstuffs to the world. So for us, our big, big challenge is how to make uh, the, the global supply chain responsible and accountable, whether it be under the climate action, whether it be under um, decent work, and of course, all of the other elements that are over equality, um, those particular issues, and, and a challenge for us all. I think for us, the big picture, um, particularly to the wider audience out there, is how do we build partnerships? Um, I could give you lots of examples of challenges of unpaid seafarers, of fishers that are kind of bonded labor when they work on factory fishing vessels, but I'm determined that we should work together. And um, I think perhaps with this pandemic, and some of the other political situations we see in the world at the moment, the responsibility of the UN bodies and our responsibility to work together in a mature and responsible and accountable way is utterly critical. So for us, the workers, um, it's really important that we build a sustainable society on uh, the sustainable goals. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that message. And, and Bridget, I'd like to turn to you next because um, you're our resident scientist in this conversation. Uh, you're bringing that dimension here to the table. You've been working um, quite fascinatingly with um, identifying algal blooms. Um, it's a big issue happening globally. It impacts economies. I'm not sure everyone is um, as familiar with it as you are. <laughs> um, and I understand you have a couple of slides to illustrate to us why this is so important. And, and this is really an area where we can see quite directly um, the impact of ocean action having beyond in our societies and when it comes to um, other issues of sustainability. So highlight for us what's at stake here. Yeah, definitely. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, having me here today, Friends of the Ocean Action and World Economic Forum. It's such an honor. 
Um, and I want to also acknowledge the audience who's taking the time to be here. Hopefully this inspires action and we all end up moving forward into a healthier, happier uh, planet. So that would be great. Um, in terms of what the ocean offers us and what's at stake, I know we've talked a lot about economy, um, but which is incredibly important, but also I want to point out human health. So it's not, you know, just the jobs, but the health and healthy seafood. But um, during this pandemic, especially, I've been thinking about the ocean as a place for mental health as well. Um, and so, you know, a healthy ocean is a place for us to go to take a swim, to catch a few waves. And it's really important to have these places on the planet where we can just take some deep breaths and, you know, find that mental health as well. So the ocean and a healthy ocean is critical for that. Um, I do work with something called harmful algal blooms. So algae is um, small microscopic organisms that they are part of a healthy ecosystem. They provide us oxygen and food, but sometimes you can have too much of a good thing and they can cause problems. Um, these images here are showing algal blooms from around the globe and you can see they can be very dramatic uh, visually, although some are more subtle. Um, but along with changing the water color, they also um, have impacts, including producing toxins. So they can have all sorts of negative impacts. Um, and you can imagine if you're a small coastal town relying on fisheries, the ocean is part of your traditions, all of those aspects are going to be largely impacted by this coastal toxic uh, bloom. So this is what we're focusing on at uh, NASA. And there's uh, great news because there are ways we can address this problem. And like uh, Steve mentioned, it comes down to partnerships and working broadly and together at um, creating solutions. Another thing I like to point out when I talk about harmful algal blooms is to remind people these are microscopic organisms, tiny little organisms. And look what they can do when they work together. They have an incredible impact on the global system. And I think we should all find inspiration in that. Think of what we can do if these guys can pull this off. We have all sorts of potential if we work together. So I want to keep that in mind as well. Thank you. A really excellent and an optimistic note and a, and a message um, I think that we're certainly hearing here. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that we have this poll, um, which we are going to bring in now the results on our screen. The question was, which other SDGs do you think ocean protection will help achieve? And I mean, the, the answer here um, in terms of, of what everybody thinks is quite clear, climate action, zero hunger, uh, no poverty. We're also seeing gender equality life below water, which is SDG 14 already. So <laughs> that was already what we were talking about, um, but important to emphasize. Um, and I would like to ask the High Commissioner for her reaction to this, um, High Commissioner Bachelet. Um, and perhaps you can also integrate for us um, your firsthand experience, perhaps with, with, with how, um, you know, some of the SDGs that have been mentioned here, um, were interrelated with the ocean action that you took in your native Chile, where you served two terms as president. You had an incredible impact um, also in other areas of society um, based upon the actions that you took there. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Can, uh, may I just say a couple of things before about uh, particular human rights costs on the ocean? Because I, I didn't mention it, but I think it's important is because on the ocean, we have the same human rights violation that on land, because we have, because uh, Stephen was speaking about that, but because we have forced labor, modern forms of slavery, child labor, sexual abuse, uh, thefts, and even murder, uh, is probably one of the most rampant uh, areas of the economy where you have violation of human rights. And also the, the issue of these huge fleets that uh, deprive, uh, uh, local fishermen with uh, the products and, and many of those products are sell in industrialized countries and uh, so they are producing also food insecurity. So it has a lot of opportunities uh, and it gives a lot of possibilities like zero hunger, like fighting climate change and so on. But we need to be clear on how we build better, back better, how we really ensure that the protection of oceans can ensure that you can reach all those goals because if you, whatever you do in, in, to support the blue economy is only based on profitability and not thinking on human rights and human dignity, 
we will produce more harm than, 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 than good. But as what I can share with you as former president of Chile, because Chile is a country with a long, long coast, and of course, fishery is a very important part of the economy, but we were so convinced that climate change was a reality that we needed to protect our marine, uh, marine areas. So uh, we decided to do that. We decided to, to work on that. And I think Chile is now at the forefront of marine conservation at the global level with 42.4% of marine areas under official protection. And among other, among other policies, a national biodiversity strategy 2016 to 2030 was adopted because we understood that climate change will produce all these kind of effects that will not permit us to advance in the agenda of 2030 to leave no one behind. Because of course, you can fish a lot and if you over exploit the ocean, then in the future, you will have a big problem and sectors that depend on fishing for food, but also for, for the livelihoods will not have a possibility. So we understood that that was really important to protect uh, marine areas, uh, and but also to develop other kinds of activities like national parks and so on, that we will ensure that we, we have sort of a reserve for the country or for the humanity in terms of climate action. And we tried to do it in a way to deal, it was not very easy, I have to really say, uh, to try to, how can I say, convince the, some other sectors the, of the economy that this was a good thing. But at the end, I was so convinced that it was necessary that I pushed forward and, and, and I'm happy to do that because we also could see that um, all fishermen, I mean, fishermen, that local fishermen like in Easter Island, on Island Juan Fernandez, they use their ancestral ways of fishing and they did it great. And they could uh, share with other fishermen or in many other places of the world that this can be done and we can protect uh, small islands like the Marshall Islands and others because they are not, on their case, it's not about what could happen in the future, it's what's happening now. Because with high rising sea levels, many of the people who live in the coastal areas had to, had to leave, and then they, they are internally displaced. And that can also create a problem of peace and security, plus food insecurity, and so on. So, so I really believe that it, it is beyond the ocean, but it's also with the ocean. And, and we need also to, as uh, Stephen was talking about partnerships, and how we all work together to strengthen the use of uh, effective national policies and laws, and also we, how we use different platforms like the Human Rights Council, for example, or the climate negotiations, or the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And I think that so proactively support the human rights approach uh, to environmental action, but also including the conservation of our oceans. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Minister Kabua, I'm wondering if you want to weigh in on there, on that, um, on, on what the High Commissioner said, um, and specifically to elaborate on, on how ocean protection is helping you achieve some of your goals for society. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And, and um, I just want to mirror what, what the High Commissioner mentioned. Um, definitely, uh, here in the Marshall Islands, you know, it's, it's, it's a reality that we're facing now. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, uh, the great point that was raised about, you know, looking back to traditional ways of, of fishing. Uh, fishing industry is, is uh, one of the largest industries in the Marshalls. Um, and now we see the importance of, of looking to more sustainable means of you know, harvesting the fish, and, and these are the cultural means. But I wanted to also bring up, um, before getting into this position, I worked heavily um, with uh, environmental conservation, um, namely this uh, World Bank project that was uh, introduced to the Marshall Islands, the Pacific Resilience um, pro uh, Program. And that project focuses on coastal resilience and preparing our people for um, pending emergencies, disaster um, from natural disasters. And during that time, uh, we came to realize that the, the more marginalized groups included women, um, women and, and people of disability. So as a nation, uh, we recognize the importance of protecting them. And through that, we look to empowering them economically 
um, linking jobs that that the ocean can provide to these women who you know are are you know nestled in the homes they they uh, are are mostly um, house mothers um, and um, also providing uh, opportunities for young girls um, in the education sector as well. Uh, just to to make sure that no one is left behind um, while we're trying to to fight this fight um, against against climate change, um, and we definitely recognize the power of partnership. As a small island nation, we can only do so much. Uh, we can yell and scream on the international level, but it's important for us to band with our. Um, our Pacific Island uh, brothers and sisters, as well as larger nations. And we want to thank um, all those who have, you know, turned to us um, and, and held our hands uh, throughout this fight. And I'm, I'm grateful to be one of two women in, in our parliament, um, alongside former president, Dr. Hilda C. Heine, who is a climate activist um, as well. So partnering with her, um, we want to empower women, we want to empower the youth, because they will be the ones, the drivers to protecting our nation, especially um, here in, in the small island states. Um, but as, as the High Commissioner mentioned, um, it, it, it's uh, a, a sad reality for us, and it's quite scary. Um, and we cannot deny the fact that one of the, the options that people are facing and what we're seeing today is a large number of um, migrants out of our nation. These are people who could have, have um, provided for our country, but we understand that we can't hold them back because they have to provide for their families as well. So to mirror and to highlight what uh, the president of Kiribati um, mentioned, preparing our people to migrate with dignity. Uh, which is why education is very important. Um, and these are some topics that I also wanted to bring in. Uh, migration out because of the effects of climate change on our ocean especially and uh, gender empowerment. Thank you. So I think I counted three SDGs there. Gender equality, partnership for the goals, and decent work and economic growth. So I um, mean, really interesting to see how, how this is playing out um, in your country. And, and Bridget, I'd like to turn to you now for your reaction um, to what we saw from the poll, first of all. Um, and also, I wanted to also integrate one of the um, questions that we have from our participants, who is thanking us for the poll um, and asking, in your opinion, what is the greatest ocean problem that we need to tackle in order to help alleviate poverty and boost sustainable development. I mean, as, as you're really on the ground there on the front lines, what do you think? Um, wow, that's a big one. Um, so, I mean, I think for us to address these ocean challenges, um, I think, yeah, we definitely need to step back and acknowledge like this session is doing how the ocean reaches far beyond its shores. And we need um, a systematic approach to addressing these issues. So if we're going to fix the ocean and where I'm working at is the coastal ocean, we can't separate that ocean from what's going on uh, inland, up the rivers. You know, we have to think about the landscapes. And then we have to have visionaries who can think, you know, how do we make these connections from the shores um, to the ocean as sustainable as possible? So green infrastructure and wetlands and things like that. Um, and also, in order to address these um, issues, we need to do a lot with partnerships um, and with monitoring. Obviously, as a scientist, we always like data, and we often think of data being gathered by, you know, a scientist going out and sitting in the field somewhere. But I think we need to expand that vision and what we think of as scientists. So yes, of course, we have expertise in scientists, but there's also so much to be gained by working with citizens people who are on the ground, whose communities are impacted all the time. And there's I know, a lot of possibility right now. People with smartphones and apps can give us a lot of valuable information that tells us how their system is unique. And then we can you know, gather that and have a better understanding. So we're gonna address these broad issues. You know, it really comes down to acknowledging what everyone can bring to this 
to the discussion and making sure all the voices are heard. And that's a great way uh, to move forward. None of us are alone in this. You know, we all have to work together. And that includes academics and governments and, you know, uh, industry, of course, they have so much expertise and lots of technologies to offer. And then, of course, the people. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, over to you next. Um, I'd like to ask you for your response. Um, we heard about human rights at sea, not only on land. You, you highlighted it. The High Commissioner highlighted it. Um, one particular area that I was quite curious to ask you about is where you see the opportunities um, aligned to both protect seafarers and the oceans. Um, and perhaps you can talk about that in, in the context of, um, of the SDGs and where you see the potential there. Thank you. I think, I think again, we, we, it's always a pleasure to be on these panels because we all come from different perspectives, but we all kind of share the overall vision that only by working together can we solve the problem. So I mean, I've got a lot of statistics here, 60 million people work in the fishing industry, um, 20, 20 million in agriculture and 40 million capturing live fish. But I think it's a little bit like, how do we, and I, and I think I wanna tackle the question of migrant work from the other side. So the reality is there's lots of precarious work and migrant workers in shipping and in fishing, and it's kind of critical but what we would describe as the economic employer. So the receivers of the fruits of the oceans, whether it's, whether it's fished by fishers, then transported by seafarers, it's ultimately us, the consumers, have to have a conversation with ourselves about what's our responsibility. So for us, it's that connection between, and particularly in this period of time when we've all been in lockdown and going to the local store that's the only place that's open, the fishers, the seafarers, the transport workers have been bringing those and making sure we have all sustained ourselves through this period. But again, we have to look at that partnership. And that's where, I, you know, for us, there's issues of climate, there's challenging with, you know, the ships that, we, that our seafarers on are on old technology, that they are very heavy in contributing to pollution and the climate challenges. And again, we need to work with the ship owners, the employers, and potentially the receivers of goods about how we transfer that industry into being climate sustainable and time is running and we all know the challenges we have there in the issue of uh, the human rights i think we all know that migrant workers are the most vulnerable when it comes to being protected by national legislation because if you're on the sea, you're, you're kind of lost and you're governed by multiple jurisdictions. So for us, again, it's how do we use modern technology to blockchain or processes of guaranteeing payments of wages, health and safety standards, particularly health and safety in this period of uh, uh, challenging to post COVID. We've seen what can happen with poor sanitary standards and those issues. And we have to look across the whole of the sustainable quality. So whether it's making sure the oceans are clean and dealing with the pollution, I can I could list you the, the, the 17 fundamental we have partnerships, but partnerships with power, it doesn't work if the United Nations bodies, whichever one you work with, doesn't have the authority to hold governments, I would say, and also the multi the multinational corporations responsible. Um, we've worked with many, many supermarkets who are very interested in sustainable supply chains. And now we have to work together with governments and people to deliver that. Sarah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, when it comes to sustainable supply chains, um, how do you see the opportunity right now for that to be framed better from the perspective of, of the, the consumer, really in financial terms as well? What sort of action would you like to see? Well, I think we, we, we've been lucky or because maritime is a very unique industry, we have one of the most enforceable international labor organization conventions, the Maritime Labor Convention, which guarantees seafarers minimum wages and decent employment contracts. And we think we should look for a convention, again, in, in Geneva through the ILO for the global supply chain. We need transparency. We need the only way you can tackle child labor, indentured labor, is by having an accountability and a transparency. We have many of the multinationals who want to see that want to see a changing 
playing field in respect of commercial competition about ensuring if they provide a minimum living wage in wherever you're from, whichever part of the globe you belong in, uh, whichever part of the world you come from, that you can then enforce. Now, that means we really are dealing with globalization on the highest level, but we must rely on the UN bodies to have the power of enforcement. And we see so many, many detractors from that these days. In the labor movement, we believe in the tripartite model. So it's critical that the international conventions are ratified by governments and provide opportunities for enforcement and penalties where there is an enforcement. I want to talk now about um, ocean action in, in the context of this post-pandemic recovery. Um, we heard about it from the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Um, it's also been mentioned throughout our conversation. Um, in the past week, Klaus Schwab, um, the founder of the World Economic Forum and, ex and executive chairman said the following. Um, he said the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world so so quite ambitious here um this has been a conversation that's been been coming up all week and, and hi commissioner bachelet i'd like to ask you to weigh in um, and establish that connection of how big an opportunity ocean action is for any economic recovery and, and these connections that we have been talking about in our conversation i mean you mentioned the seventh biggest economy in the world surely that that has more potential than is being currently harnessed right now well, yes, I think it's an opportunity, as uh, Secretary General has uh, introduced that concept of building back better, because uh, we don't know what to go to the zero day before the pandemics, because we have seen that uh, what the, the pandemics have led there is the inequalities in our societies and within uh, and, and among countries. And we don't want to go back there. We see that the economic model now is not inclusive, neither sustainable. So what we need to build back is an economy that can be a blue economy or a green economy and, or a mix of them, but that, that, that they, are, they are based on, 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 on other concepts, on inclusiveness and sustainability, on respect of biodiversity and the nature. So for that, we require effective laws, policies and actions. We need to decouple the economic growth from environmental harmful practices hmm? and, and incentivize sustainable development for, for people and the planet. Um, I think we should promote in the economy recovery um, a just transition to an equitable decarbonized economy that supports sustainable lives uh, and livelihoods. Um, properly protected oceans can be an, um, I would say, an engine for long-term um, uh, sustainable development, new livelihoods, and also climate uh, system stability, as I mentioned before. You know, nobody knows exactly what means blue economy because it doesn't have a single definition, but what governments and corporations have identified, that's a lot of opportunities there. And they mentioned different areas like expanded uh, fisheries on aquaculture or tourism or bio prospecting uh, or oil and gas, or renewable energy, shipping. And all of this is very important, but I want to go back to what I said before. Because of what we live in the pandemic, uh, we know that human beings are important and that should be the main issue. So if we have all these opportunities for the economy recovery, it's fine, it's great, but rentability should not be the, the main goal. It should include respect for human beings, human dignity. So we need to be vigilant huh? because, because of the lockdown, uh, some companies have been trying to call for a relaxation of regulation including some companies that are the big violators of human rights. So we have to be vigilant because this cannot happen. Instead, we need to build a new ocean economy, environmentally sustainable and socially equitable. Huh? Because we need to go back also to those local communities who live from fishery and have been affected by, by big ones. So I would think we need to agree on a few basic principles, I may say. Equity, human rights and sustainability have to be um, precedence over profits uh, at any cost in international negotiations. Uh, second, SDG should be the drivers. Uh, the SDG should be the drivers on this discussion and no industry should be excluded from this. Um, maybe, um, I don't know if um, ILO it's, uh, alone should be working on this because it's, it's true, ILO, ILO is very active on all of, 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 of the companies and, and the workers and so on. And it's true what uh, they have said about 
the importance of the migrants and, and the terrible situation of migrants. And the other thing is, yes, we have governments that respect the Convention of the Sea and so on, but we have a huge human rights violation in illegal fishing. So I think we need to define more clearly the responsibility of governments and all stakeholders against illegal fishing. Um, so we need, um, and maybe, I don't know if in ECOSOC or in another place, we need some, some agency or something responsible for developing best practices and um, international guidelines for the implementation and management of the blue economy, if I may say. Um, I think government has to stop and not accept the use of forced uh, labor in the fishing uh, fleets, and perpetrators must be held accountable and bring to justice. Because otherwise, if there's impunity, these things are will continue happening. Um, and government needs to develop guidelines that require equitable treatment of local communities. And any wealth that is produced should be shared also with the local communities. And we had ex experience in my country where we develop um, renewables. I mean, some companies will sort of uh, be placed in some places when they put this, you know, huge windmills and so on. But communities around there, they will receive as, as well certain benefits of that. Um, I think we need also measures to enhance environmental protection of the ocean are essential because it's like a preventive medicine for the planet. And, um, and I think an effective response to COVID-19 and environmental crisis must be global, uh, grounded in solidarity and in respect for humanity. And we need to also, and I think one of the big lessons of COVID-19 is that we need to understand risk and we need to plan for it huh? and, and, and because not to deny them, not to ignore them. So plan ahead and think in the, long, in the short, medium and long term. I think that's the biggest lesson of, of one of the biggest lessons. Uh, and it has to be considered on the building back better. Uh, finally, I, I, I do believe in we need to protect oceans because the other important role that they play on all these different aspects. And I can say it's not only possible, it is imperative and it can be done. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there was probably a lot in there that, that Steve, you want to respond to, but I'd like to go to Bridget first, um, just to, to distribute the time evenly. And Bridget, ask you, because you've spoken in the past about the importance of innovation. Um, I'm wondering how you see that in the context um, of any so-called blue recovery, um, as we've heard, and especially the fact that, you know, you, you've mentioned it needs to happen across academia, governments, industry. Um, what is your message? What is your call to action in, in the way that you see those interacting right now and what could potentially be, be done better? Um, great, thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of a call to action, I mean, it is getting out of our silos and you know, working across disciplines and Right now in science, you know, we get excited when a physicist talks to a biologist, but we need to move well beyond that. You know, talking to uh, politicians, talking to human rights activists, we need to understand how what we know about the natural world and how it's changing is impacting our societies. Um, and then also you mentioned technologies and how to bring that in um, to the solutions. And there are so many quickly changing um, technologies that offer all sorts of um, helpful ways to monitor and learn about the situation. If we focus on harmful algal blooms, which is a you know, coastal ocean event, there's all sorts of things that we can put into the waters on buoys, on little research robots that can actually sample for you know, toxic threats and let people know we have an issue out there. But then there's also things that empower you know, people on the ground, and we need to talk to, um, you know, traditional knowledge, which was mentioned, um, and understand, you know, what we can do when we bring all of these together. There is an effort right now, there's a global HAB program that already coordinates um, researchers across disciplines to address HABs and societal issues, and one of uh, their big goals is to make technology more affordable. And so they're already coordinating, but there always needs to be, you know, further investment in that, you know, bring in industry, bring in investment so we can make these platforms that can really help understand and also uh, solve these problems uh, that could be 
distributed globally and you know cost is a big part of that so um, I think all of those sectors working together would be in incredibly important so that's it. thank you so much um, Steve I'd like you to weigh in now um, first of all to respond to what we heard the high commissioner say and um, second of all somebody has a really interesting question here and I'd like to see if you might want to take it on um, somebody says the ocean links together so many sustainability issues to the point where the idea has become so big, it's hard to see how to start to influence it. Okay, well, let's have a go at that. I think, I think first of all, um, that that reality is when you bring all the all the elements together. Um, I'm hoping. I think all all the voices in Labour are hoping that the post COVID nineteen will shake up society and recognize that it can't all be about profit and we have to build resilience in whatever part of the economy we have to deal with and and, and we're dealing with the ocean today and you know when you, whether you look at it for those that work on it work in it or the beneficiaries of it we have to find much better ways less bureaucratic ways more deliverable ways to to, to build protections into that process if you look at the workers in a lot of our set my sectors they are southeast asians working on a global economy now in reality and i think this goes to the equitability point we have to and predominantly when we deal with the climate change um we're appealing to the to young people and to women and if we don't tackle those two elements running alongside all of these big challenges um we won't find the answers and now without being too too political i think there's a conversation about corporate social responsibility the power of of big multinationals and there are some that are ready to work with us and i mean us i mean all of us in this this panel and the community who who understand that if if we don't write off some of the debt i didn't even get into africa and fishers there's a whole, whole plethora of stories and challenges there but the reality must be for us that we have to deal with debt as we understand it today but then also build in the best practices the high commissioner spoke about if we don't share how do we build a better economy and how do we build opportunities for women to have equal opportunity and then also young people to believe in the decision makers because I think when you talk about the ocean and you talk about each and every part uh, we have tourism members as well and their, their jobs and livelihoods are decimated at the moment we need to get them back in the process but for us it's how do we hold each other accountable on Labour's part we're ready to, to sit at any table take any opportunity, take any one of the sustainable goals and bring our part to that conversation. But we need strong governance. And perhaps part of this COVID-19 is about putting more emphasis on corporations to be less short term and, and be more accountable for reinvesting their profits in a way that gives the wider community, the different parts, the global south, an opportunity to develop quickly without relying on heavy pollutant uh, technology and and i think technology is part of the answer but it has to be handled very very responsibly thank you and i'd just like to mention um, before we get minister kavua's reaction to that um when it comes to a blue recovery sustainable and inclusive recovery um we actually got some disheartening news this week saying that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have actually risen um, strongly to a new peak this year, despite the impact of the global effects of the coronavirus crisis, but this, you know, despite these lockdowns that we have been seeing around the world. Um, so it really, it really shows that it is a trend um, that really dramatically and urgently needs to be reversed. Um, Minister Kabua, I'd like to ask you, as an island nation, what action would you like to see from policymakers, and from industry. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I want to turn us to um, some of the talks that took place this week uh, during this um, this dialogue, uh, namely from the getting to zero um, session. And um, from those talks, I, I reiterated the the importance and the role of IMO. Um, in, in this um, path to decarbonization. The Marshall Islands is the third largest ship registry. We are um, in charge of 9% of the ships that are on the seas right now. Um, and 
from our perspective, it, it we want to, um, again, drive the importance of IMO to tackle the uh, carbon tax issue um, as, as soon as possible. Right now, actually, we do not have time uh, to, to dawdle about, about uh, with this issue. And um, I'm, I'm very disappointed uh, with, with the, the news that you just um, brought in. Um, and, you know, it, it's time. It's time for us to, to really kick it into gear and to answer your questions about um, the question that came up from, from one of our viewers about this, you know, dialogue being such a massive, um, massive issue. You know, how, how do you begin to tackle it? It's uh, it, recognizing the value of each other and, and partnerships and, you know, not trying to uh, accomplish all, the, all these things um, just from one person, just from one nation. It's important for us to work together um, as one, as, as the panelists um, mentioned earlier, uh, and to really, really capitalize on each other's um, fortes. Uh, but yes, that's that's one of the actions that I, I really want to see. IMO tackling the carbon tax issue. Thank you. And just a really quick follow up, actually, for you. Um, one of our viewers also had the question, um, Minister Kabua, um, how you, as the education minister, teach your citizens in order to be ocean friendly. Great question. Um, I, I mentioned earlier um, the, the, the current education system that we're in. You know, it's, it's westernized. We, we brought this Western um, system of education and tried to force fit our people. You know, we're wired differently. We're people um, that, that came from ancestors that, that use their hands. Um, so we want to focus on more place-based learning instead of um, trying to, you know, uh, limit our children to classroom uh, reading books and languages that are not that are not our own, um, but to take them outside, expose them to the environment, really, um, you know, making it making education real time, you know, uh, associating climate change to to what they see you know, coastal erosion to coral bleaching, so on and so forth. So the there is a new education system that we're implementing um, here on out. And it's a four track system. One of the two tracks is um, is traditional vocational, which, you know, focuses on cultural education, traditional education, as well as, um, you know, modern vocational and, and um, working with the hands. We think that if we reintroduce our people to our environment, um, that will bring back the sense of ownership, the sense of oneness, and the sense of being part of this complex ecosystem, not only in the Marshall Islands, not only in our respective islands, but as global citizens. Thank you so much. I mean, a lot of lessons actually to be learned in there because perhaps it, it really starts a, at a very fundamental level, understanding the importance of, of ocean action um, and this interconnectedness that we have been discussing throughout our panel. Um, we asked the question in the beginning of our panel, how can we make those connections between the ocean and the rest of society more explicit and drive the sustainable development agenda forward in a way that benefits people and nature alike? And we just have a couple of moments from each of you um, to give us your final thoughts, um, and Bridget, I'd like to begin with you. Um, I think what we really need to keep in mind when we address these issues is that knowledge is power. And like was said, these large, large issues can be very overwhelming, but we also need to explain to people the risk of inaction. So even if you can't solve all the problems with your actions, you know, any step that we take is a movement in the right direction. So we need to break it down and you know, remind people that it, it can be done and it will only be done if we all work together. So don't, it is hard, it is overwhelming, but you know, it, we've solved problems before and we can do it again if we work together. So giving people enough understanding to not just feel overwhelmed, but to understand that solutions come from these conversations and it can 
we can do it. Any little bit helps and we'll get it done. We all play our part. Um, that, that's, that's refreshing because sometimes it can be so frustrating when you see just how, um, you know, how overwhelming the, the monstrosity of what needs to be dealt with is. Um, Steve, your final remarks. Thanks and uh, thank, thank you everyone for the opportunity to be on the panel and share such views. I think my, my overwhelming word I want us all to take away is to build trust because it doesn't matter where you fit in the ecosystem of the ocean, it's utterly critical that we all trust each other and that requires honesty, integrity, responsibility and accountability. So for us, it's how do, how do you hold all the players accountable, tackle the abuses, but ultimately do the right thing sounds a little cheesy but ult we have to respond to the climate challenge and that means everybody has to play their part it yeah. takes more work to in be inclusive but it's utterly critical if we want to build a sustainable uh, acceptable morally responsible future so thank you minister kabua thank you um as a big um encourager of, of tradition. I, I want to um, make known some of the fundamental um, values of Marshallese people. You know, it's, it's we're, we're a culture that's founded on respect, on knowing how to care for others, and um, of, of loving each other. And again, I know it sounds cheesy, but these are the drivers. These are the, the, the fundamental values that we need to inculcate. Um, in order to uh, overcome any challenge that we may be faced with. Uh, this pandemic, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a brief outlook on what we can expect. Um, it, it, I, I think that this is a much smaller scale of what is on the horizon, um, larger ramifications that we can expect from climate change. So we just need to get rid of our sense of trying to make a profit Work together to try to save this this earth, um, and and I want to thank the World Economic Forum. Thank you, Sarah, for moderating this event, and thank you to the pan panelists and the viewers. Moldava. Hi, Commissioner Bachelet. Well, um, unfortunately, we cannot choose one SDG. We have to do the whole Agenda 2030 because as we have been discussing, they're also interconnected and intertwined. And if we advance once, it will be helping advancing others as well, as we know that women are essential to, to the fulfillment of others. But also, it's like when we say that human rights are not indivisible. You cannot choose, I respect this human rights and I won't respect the other. So it will take time. We have a decade until 2030. And probably one of the problems that we have now is that because of the COVID pandemic, many countries have diverted the money that they were for the Agenda 2030, for the SDGs, to the response of the COVID. So that's why it's so important that the, the international community, governments, uh, private sector, workers, and of course, uh, as civil society, empowered civil society can find the ways. And of course, I would say also international financial institutions, because we need to ensure that we have a good response to the pandemic. But on the other hand, when we start the recovery, we link it in a very strong way with the Agenda 2030 to leave no one behind. Because if we have been better prepared in terms of not that level of inequalities, I think this pandemic would have been different. So we have no choice. <laughs> we need to never give up, uh, be enthusiastic and, and work together. And, and I know that it's not easy, but it can be done. It's humanity's survival plan. We yes. need to do it. We need to do it. Uh, there is no other option. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Um, that concludes our, our conversation portion, but we really have um, a treat for you now because Donna Betterelli has been watching um, our session and she is going to join us now for some closing remarks. She is the special advisor for the Blue Economy for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And I'll give her the floor now. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Sarah. I would like to start by thanking the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action, and more particularly, Kristen Tretecki for the work that went into organizing these virtual ocean dialogues. So much has been covered this week, and I don't think that one single speaker from government officials, scientists, NGOs, and private sector didn't address sustainability when it comes to the ocean and the blue economy. 
This is a big improvement just from a year ago. So while the pandemic has caused disruptions and cut demand and supply across all sectors of the blue economy, with devastating social and economic impacts, more so for the small islands developing states and coastal communities, the world has come to realize two things. The first is that the fate of humanity is tightly linked to the health of the natural world, and more particularly, the health of the ocean, which covers, as you all know, two thirds of our planet and plays a critical role in regulating our climate and making life as we know it possible. The second, again, without minimizing the, defect, the devastating effects of COVID, is that the pandemic has led to a positive impact on marine and land ecosystems. Less transport means less greenhouse gas emissions, less natural resource extraction, and at the same time, more opportunities for ecosystems and species to recover and reproduce. In 2018, the IPCC special report on global warming concluded, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. In light of the pandemic and the associated reduction in human activities worldwide, we can see the potential impact of such measures. So to take Peter Thompson's words, we are at the crossroad to choose either to go back the way we used to or choose the green blue road and make a sustainable recovery a reality. I firmly believe that we can combine production and protection, but one cannot go without the other. For that, we need to find a new financial language for conservation that resonates with all stakeholders. The economic value of conservation and of the ecosystem's biodiversity, a fish when it's alive, coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass, must be assessed versus the economic value of harvesting and extracting these resources, which is how the value of the ocean has been calculated so far. This assessment needs to be included in economic policies and planning if we are to achieve a sustainable blue economy. So the way forward is a multilateral and multi-sectoral cooperation and global coordination, in addition to adding value, introducing sustainable and circular economy practices in production and consumption, and diversifying towards economic activities that have a lower impact on ecosystems, and at the same time, allow job creation. Moreover, we have seen momentum built to use data, research, and innovative technologies in order to achieve these objectives. I was pleased to hear this week that it is no longer only scientists and NGOs calling on ocean management. We heard from the industry and CEOs that are calling on governments for ocean regulation, transparency, traceability, and public accountability because consumers, particularly young people, are now more aware than ever of the importance of having sustainably sourced food. So the momentum is here, it's now. Communities worldwide are asking for concrete results, actionable and binding measures, especially in view of COVID recovery. In times like these, people need good news and hope for the future. And that can be achieved this year with a successful outcome for the long awaited High Seas Treaty, the elimination of harmful fisheries subsidies, and continuing efforts towards 30% of the ocean highly protected by 2030. And as we celebrate this year, the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica, the designation of three large MPAs representing 4 million square kilometers, that would constitute one of the biggest acts of nature protection in history. Since 2015, with the Paris Agreement and the establishment of sustainable development goals, we have clear targets and we know what needs to be done. By achieving SDG 14, life below water, we will achieve the majority of the other SDGs. This is such a vital time for the world. We have the chance now more than ever to decide what future we want for our children. I'm hopeful that 2020 will be remembered not because of this global sanitary and economic crisis, but because we collectively understood that a pandemic knows no borders, climate change knows no borders, fish, birds, and many other species know no borders. So we have the choice then to come together and take bold actions for a sustainable, healthy, and prosperous future for us all. Thank you very much.
an important message and, and a great place uh, to conclude our session today. Um, Beyond Ocean, which has been hosted by the Friends of Ocean Action and the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much to Donna Betterelli for, for those closing remarks. Thank you so much for our panelists, uh, participants, High Commissioner Bachelet, Minister Kabua, Steve Cotton, Dr. Bridget Seegers, um, for all of your contributions to this conversation. Um, and for our participants, to you uh, for joining us um, on this Friday uh, for such an important conversation. And please do not forget that it continues. There's actually opportunity for registered participants to connect on TopLink. Um, and to share your thoughts and views. You can also continue to do so on Slido. Um, so do take advantage of that. There's time now for a coffee break. Thereafter, there will be deep dive discussions um, that partners will be leaving. Those will occur from 1830 to 1930 CEP. So do feel free to join in on those. Um, thank you to all of you for your participation. I'd like to say uh, it's been a great pleasure to be your moderator. My name is Sarah Kelly. Take care and stay safe.